Thanks for clicking in. We upload new videos every week, so go ahead and subscribe for some encouragement. You also may feel led to sow into the ministry, and we have several different ways to do so. Your giving goes towards our outreaches we do all year round. Now, let's listen in. You know, as we enter or we have entered into this election season, you're, you're beginning to see the different parties go back and forth a little bit. And, and I heard this term used recently that I said, oh, that fits right in with my message. And somebody had said on one of the networks I was watching, let the mudslinging begin. Because that's what happens in politics. Very seldom do we fight about facts. We tend to sling mud. We tend to bash people because of, in areas of their insecurities. Things that we know will make them cry. Things that we know will, will make them crumble. Things that we know will make their voice crack. That's what we attack as a society. We don't go after the facts. We don't go after the real numbers. We go after the things that tie to the person's humanity. And the way the world operates is, if they can't find something from your 50s, they go to your 40s. They try to dig up old friends information. They go into your trash can and, and look for phone numbers and bills to, to try to get something on you. And if they can't find something from your 40s, they go back to your 30s. And if they can't find something from your 30s, they go back to your 20s. And if they cannot find something from your 20s, they, they go back to your teenage years. And I don't know how many people watching, I can tell you as your pastor, if they go back to my teenage years and that's the standard you're holding me to, go find another church today. Because I was crazy, I was deranged, I was out there and truthfully at you know, 40, I still think I'm a little crazy and deranged and in some seasons a little bit out there. But, but that's, how, that's how they fight and they use this term slinging mud. Now, when the term was used, it was one of those boxes with four different people. And, you know, they're always on the same page and see things the same way. And, and when the term slinging mud was used, all four people in the boxes looked disgusted. Because I think that's what terms like mud do to people. Or if you were to say that that person is filthy, it's like, ugh. It kind of makes most people cringe. But I'm a little bit different. I actually have to bring myself to the moment because these kind of terms when it comes to uh, dirt don't really make me cringe because these are terms I used as a child. These are terms that were used that were light in my house because when I was younger, we actually went outside to play. When I was younger, we actually would find mounds of dirt and dig tunnels and stuff like that. When I was younger, even my siblings, my younger sisters and my female cousins would be outside making not pancakes, but mud pies. So in my family, dirt was not seen as something disgusting. And I think when it comes to children... And when I think even as you grow into an adult, I think a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, the way we see things like filth and mud and dirt really comes from the types of fathers we had. Because my father was a construction worker. My father dug holes and dug asphalt every single day of his life and my father as he became a bricklayer worked with with mud so most of my life I was around dirt so there was it was seen as something was wrong with you at the end of the day in my house if you didn't come in dirty my mother planned for it she would say things like don't come in this house filthy it was assumed that when I left the house I was going to get Dirty. If I heard the term slinging mud as a child, I, I would have literally thought that me and my friends or, or my family were literally going to throw mud at each other. 
It wasn't until I got older that I realized that the term slinging mud is not a positive term. It's not a good thing to say to somebody, you know, I was so used to my mother saying, don't come in the house filthy. Boy, you're filthy. That didn't mean she didn't love me. That didn't mean that she saw a flaw with me. That didn't mean that there was some character trait that, that was going to be exposed when I was called filthy. It just meant that it's clear you had a good time, but you're not coming in my house with that good time. But I'm aware now. I'm aware. And, and, and like I said, it's because my father encouraged us to go out and get dirty. That, that was the type of family that we had. Everybody in my family as men was construction workers. So if you didn't get dirty as a young boy, and even the girls would be the same way, there was something, something wrong with you. That was inherited and passed down by, by my father. But I am aware that when it comes to terms like slinging mud it is not positive and this is what the world considers fighting with low blows it's slinging mud and sadly even Jesus had to endure this term called slinging mud and he prepared us for it because if you're going to walk with God, this term slinging mud is something that you are going to have to, to endure. And I know you don't expect for it to come at you, but if you're going to walk with God, you have to get used to people slinging mud. I have a feeling there are some people watching right now that have had some mud slung on them in this season. You've had some family talk about you. You've had some co-workers talk about you. You've had some frenemies. That's what I like to call them. Friends that became enemies. You've had some frenemies slinging mud at you. They've, they've talked about your name. They've, they've dragged your character through the dirt and through the mud. And, and I have a feeling today that God is going to give you some understanding that if you walk with God, having mud slung at you is a part of of the resume having mud slung at you is a part of the journey Jesus prepared us for look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 he says blessed are you when they are persecuted for right those that are persecuted for righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of God so right there Jesus is saying if you're filthy you're blessed if you're dirty you're blessed if you're muddy you're blessed. He says, blessed are you when men will revile you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you falsely. That's the key. There better not be the truth to it. Falsely for my sake. When that day comes, rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. You know why? For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets which are before you. Jesus says, when mud starts being slung at you, you are in the category of great people. You cannot be great and never have to duck the mud. People say they want a great leader, but what they're really saying when they say that is, I want a clean leader. Because to follow somebody like Jesus, you're going to get muddy just being connected to him. You cannot have somebody that, that is changing the culture and making great contribution. There's the word I wanted. You cannot have somebody that's making great contribution without having people contradict them it comes with the journey Jesus would also say this the student is not above the teacher nor the servant above the master it's it's enough for the student to be like their teacher and the servants to be like their masters if the head of the house has been called bells above the devil how much more should the members of his household be called that so don't be afraid of them for there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be known Jesus says 
if you're connected to somebody that's getting mud slung at them. There's a big problem if you remain clean. They cannot hate me and like you. I'm scared of people that come into my life and say they're loyal, but everybody that's against me is still friends with them. How can you say you're my friend and the mud that's hitting me if I'm hugging you is not also making you muddy too? When you get connected to somebody, you get all of my friends and I have some amazing friends. But I have some cruel enemies. I have some enemies that would like to see me die. I have some enemies that would love to see my name on a headline. I have some enemies that would like to get a whisper. I have some enemies that, that would like to have some facts. And here's the thing. If you get my friends, you cannot have my friends without also having my enemies. So sometimes you may want to sit back before you want to call somebody a friend just to see if you can handle the enemies that you did not sign up for, but because you took on a new friendship, you inherited them. Jesus says, the student is not above the master. If they hate me, they will hate you. I expect this stuff from the devil. I expect this stuff from the devil's children. But I don't expect this stuff in the church. I think that's what shocks people when they join a ministry. And then there's that eye-opening moment that, what did I just sign up for? I thought everything was praise the Lord, hallelujah, brother, this, sister, that, give me a hug, come over here, it's good to see you. I thought everything would be like that. I had no idea that I signed up for spiritual warfare. I had no idea that one out of every 12 people in my church that I love, if we're blessed, and I don't like to use the word lucky, but I'll just use it. But if we're lucky, Jesus picked one Judas out of 12 disciples. If, if we're lucky, maybe one out of every 12 members will be a Judas. I don't know, but that moment where your eyes are opened and you realize that I didn't join just a church. I signed up to be in an army that's in a fight. And Jesus would prepare us, not just for praise the Lord and hallelujah, but there's the moment you realize that we are in a, a fight. And it's not that he wants it in a church. Because when I read the Bible, I see words when it comes to God's people like cover. Cover. Don't uncover, but, but cover. Cover. Cover, love, the scripture says, covereth a multitude of sins. I, I, I see words like cover. I have this thing with God that if I know something, you said whatever's done in darkness will come to light. I get that. But I have this thing with God that if you're going to bring anything to light, I don't care what it is, it'll never come from me. It will not be on my Instagram, my Facebook. It will not come out of my mouth because God doesn't need me if he's trying to get something up, out. My job is not to be the judge and the juror. My job is to cover and love and whatever God wants to do, God wants to do. But I, I see scriptures that tell us to, to cover people. Cover means let me take the rain that's trying to hit you in the storm. I see words like cover. I see words like restore. Ye that are spiritual. Restore such a one. Spiritual people do not destroy people. Spiritual people are looking for ways to restore them in the spirit of meekness. That means I'm going to restore you and I'm not taking no credit for it. I'm going to help you get restored and I'm never bringing it up again. It's in the spirit of meekness. Considering myself, I'm literally setting the tone 
for what will happen to me in my bad season by how I treat you. So if I'm a person that covers, be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatever a man sows, that is which he will reap. If I cover you, guess what I reap? But if I expose you, guess what I reap? So I see words like cover. I see words like peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They, they will be called the children of God. That, that means not, not the hell makers, not the chaos makers, but the peacemakers, the ones that see chaos and say, let me make peace. Let me find a way to bring some peace. He says, when I see peacemakers, God says, I see my children. My children bring peace. But nevertheless, this is not always what happens. So the Bible sets up guardrails for when mudslinging starts in the ministry. Guardrails for when his people start doing it. There, there are guardrails, and Paul would tell Timothy, preparing him for what was going to come into his life. He said, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. That means that unless there are two or three people that, that hashtag what you say me too, don't even entertain it. Laugh at it. Walk away from it. Don't say, tell me more. I never would have thought. Really? Because you would be surprised how many people go stupid off a rumor. A rumor that goes against all of their revelation of a person. They did what? Oh, they should have never. If two or three people... Don't amen it. If two or three people do not have the same experience, it could be the devil trying to pull you into something that messes up not only your experience, but your future. Paul, talking to Timothy, he knew all too well about the hard road, about slinging mud at people because not only did he once do it he once slung mud at every Christian he was a Christian killer but he knows what it was like to have mud slung at him he would later tell Timothy in the second book he said you know at my first answer nobody stood with me what he's preparing Timothy for is, if you're going to get started with God, you have to get used to having seasons of loneliness. It's very common when I meet young Christians that they're afraid to, to be lonely, that they're afraid to not have their friends, that they're afraid to have to take this journey and, and not have nobody walking with them. But when you first start getting dirty, people who don't want to get dirty are going to back away from you. He says, when I first got started, nobody stood with me. All forsook me. He talks about this in one of his books. His own family forsook him. His friends forsook him. See, Paul had this problem. He was so Hebrew that the Christians didn't like him. But he was so Christian that the Hebrews didn't like him. And for all of Paul's life, he was an anomaly. He, he was somewhere in the middle and that's where you will find yourself when you get saved. I'm, 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 I'm too Christian for my unsafe friends to want to feel comfortable around me. But, but man, I've been a little jacked up because I had some history before I gave my life to Jesus. So I'm still a little bit of recovering for the Christians to accept me. So I'm a little bit stuck in the middle. God wants to tell every person that feels like you're stuck in the middle that he sees you, that you're not 
actually by yourself, that he is with you, that he is walking with you, that, that you should not get discouraged if everybody forsakes you because there's going to come a time where they wish they would have walked with you, where they wish they would have believed in you, where they wish they would have listened to you. All you got to do is keep walking. Paul says, when I got started, everybody left me. I pray and not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. And the only reason I'm standing today is because when I wanted to quit, how many have ever wanted to quit? When I wanted to quit, when I cried myself to sleep, when my back was against the wall, he strengthened me that by me, the preaching might be fully known. Paul was prepared for the hate that came with his calling. The apostles didn't even like Paul. He had to, he had to beg just to have meetings with them. Cephas, Peter, James, John, they, they, they went against everything he did. In some scriptures, they would actually go behind his back and manipulate people. But there's a reason they didn't write 60% of the New Testament. Paul knew what it was like to have to do this thing alone. And what I found in life is that when God is calling somebody and trying to use somebody, he usually finds people that when they look back over their life, they're used to being alone. But what was heartbreaking for Paul he got it with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, he understood it with the apostles. He, he said in one scripture, the more they hated me, the more I outworked them. That was his mentality. He, he was fueled off their hatred. Haters made Paul work harder. But where he did not expect it was from his baby. The church he started. He did not expect it from the church of Corinth. When he found them, they were so jacked up. I've, I've been to Corinth. And when you go to Corinth, the, the, the big thing, the big site there is the temple of Apollos in Corinth. It's probably about an hour south of Athens. I've walked there. I took my team there and taught them the book of Corinthians right there. We sat, we read scriptures right there. I sat at the judgment seat and looked down at the bema where the governor would look at criminals and decide how many beatings they should get and they would be tied to the bema. Paul himself was tied to bemas often. And this in a lot of ways is what the scripture uses to relate what the final judgment will be when we stand at the Bema seat and he stands at the judgment seat and brings up all of our sins we have committed. It will look like that right there. And in Corinth, you will see there's a big mountain. It's called Aero Corinth. And I went to the top of Aero Corinth and there are temples and at the top of Aero Corinth, they, they believed in, in healing. And what they would do is they would take these statues and I had pictures of some they found of body parts. And what you would do is you would take, you would buy the part of the body, the statue, the, the replica of a foot, an arm, uh, you know, whatever. And you would take it to the top of the mountain and they had a place where if you placed it and made the sacrifice, you could get healing in that part of your body. This is why Paul would talk about the body of Christ so much in Corinth, because they understood body parts. If I could do a Bible study, I could sit and show you how the book of Corinthians is pointed to everything in their culture. But at the top of this mountain, there would be over 2,000 prostitutes on any given day, all ages, young kids. You would see at the top of Aero Corinth. You would see men. You would see women. You, you would see women 
looking like men. You would see men dressed up as women. And in the evenings, they would come down to the city and congregate with the people of Corinth. And there were over 42 different temples or religions in Corinth. And this is where Paul would see potential. You'd be amazed that when God calls you to something, where others see trouble, you see potential. Where others see problems, you see blessings. Where others see dead ends, you see something just getting started. This is what a visionary does. A visionary looks at things that others would run from and say, I see a blessing there. I see possibility there. And see, God has a way of calling people that that will, will see potential in things that others would walk over. Like you, there are people that have come in and out of your life that did not see you for who you were, for where God was taking you. But God has a way of putting someone in your life that sees the potential of where you could go, what you could do, the impact you could have. And that's what Paul had with Corinth. And he gave his life to this church. And, and Corinth, and I'm moving on, was located strategically. It was at this tip between northern and southern Greece. And what they would do is now they actually have a canal that they've dug out and cruise ships and, and cargo ships go to and throw the canal. They did not have the canal in biblical days. So what they would do is you would pull your ship up to the docks and you would go for three days and enjoy Corinth. And in three days, they had this railway system where they would literally overland pull your boat to the other side of the water. So they wanted to create Corinth to be a place where what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It was big business in Corinth. And people would be at Corinth all the time. So if Paul could get them serious about God, the gospel would spread everywhere. Because it was a sailing point. And they could not go under because they would call that dead man's turn. And, and ships that tried to go all the way around because the winds were so strong, they would be sunken in the sea. So you had to go through this port to get to Rome, and Rome was the headquarters. So to get to Rome, to Turkey, Rome, to Israel, Rome, to Africa, everybody had to go through Corinth. And Paul saw the strategy in Corinth. If I get Corinth, I can hit Rome, I can hit Turkey, I can hit Europe, if I can hit Africa. But Corinth... Is like a Goliath. And to get Corinth, I'm going to have to be willing to give all of myself. So he gives all of himself to Corinth. He teaches them the basics because they're not Hebrew. He has to teach them the basics, like babies in a way. He's not dealing with people that can recite. The, the, the Pentateuch, because Jewish kids have to be able to recite the first 12 books of the Bible or the first five books of the Bible by the age of 12. He's not dealing with PKs and church kids. He's dealing with Pookie and Ray Ray and, and the, you know, those that hang out at the clubs. And it takes a different kind of anointing. You got you to gotta be patient. You have to have understanding. You have to know when to shut up and when to speak with people that are just getting started. And Paul has literally watched them crawl. And now they're beginning to turn on him. They're beginning to question his revelation. They're beginning to create cliques and following other leaders that did not come around to get them started. But now that they are seen as potential, they're wanted. When I started our church, I remember Bishop Clifford Johnson told me, go after the ones nobody wants and make them into the ones everybody wants. 
The problem is, once they become the ones everybody wants, everybody goes after them. Because people really don't want to put the hard work because it's dirty to put that kind of work into people when they're getting started. But now they're questioning Paul. And the worst thing you can do to a great leader, a, a strong leader, a, a smart leader, the worst thing you can do is question their revelation, question their leadership. Do they not know who Paul was? Paul was royalty. He said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of kings in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I was a Hebrew of, of Hebrews. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was touching the law. I was a Pharisee. Do they not know who Paul was? He was concerning, he says, concerning a zeal. He was persecuting the church. If, if he thought the only reason he attacked the church is because he didn't understand this Jesus thing was the real deal. And he thought by attacking the church, he was doing God a favor. He always loved God, even when he loved God wrong. Paul was somebody. They don't just have a rookie preacher. They, they, they got the greatest since Jesus. He was so great that he wrote 60% of the New Testament. They don't realize who they got. And sometimes, if you're not careful, you will not realize who you got? Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You'll see him in Acts talk about Gamaliel and how he, he sat at Gamaliel's feet. Gamaliel was the best teacher of the generation. You could not get better than Gamaliel. He was the point of revelation for their generation. Paul, it says, sat at his feet. He, he didn't just show up to his teachings. Paul was like an Elijah to an Elijah. That's why Paul had so many sons like, like Timothy and, and Titus and Silas. Because you cannot be a good spiritual father if you fail at being a spiritual son. Paul sat at a man's feet and it was Gamaliel because when you sit at somebody's feet, they know you. It's like if somebody tells a mother something about their child, no way, no way. Or a father, no, no way. I remember when I was going to court for getting into an altercation and, you know, with an FBI agent and they began to say things about me and I was troubled. But everything that was a lie, my father was there. He said, nope, that's not him. If, if you're telling me one lie, where are all the other lies? Because when somebody really knows you, they know what you're capable of and they know what you're not capable of. You want to tick me off? Blame me for something I'm not capable of. <laughs> and when Gamaliel saw the change in Paul, Look at what he says in, in Acts when they're coming uh, against Paul. He says, refrain yourself from these men. Leave them alone for this counsel. If it be a work of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you find yourself fighting against God. What he's saying is, I know that boy. And he's not cuckoo. I want to say for Cocoa Puffs. But somebody in their 20s would say, what is that? But Gamaliel, actually, when they're coming against Paul in Jerusalem, he say, I, I leave him alone because I know that boy. And if he's saying this thing is real and he had an encounter, he's not the type of person that makes up stuff. Paul sat at Gamaliel's feet. And before I move on to every person that says, I want to be great, I want to be used by God. Moses. Joshua had Moses. David had King Saul. Elisha had Elijah. Ruth had Naomi. Timothy had Paul. Paul had Gamaliel. 
to every person that wants to be great, my question to you is this. While you're sitting at home right now or your job or, or at the gym listening to me, my question is this. Whose feet do you sit at? Because Jesus would lay out a model of touching feet. It all starts at feet. Whose feet are you sitting at? Paul sat at Gamaliel's feet. And now this church is insulting his greatness by questioning him. And they're beginning to say things like he's not qualified. They're beginning to say things like he can't speak. They're beginning to say things like maybe God's not with him. They're beginning to say, you know, like Miriam and Aaron, they're beginning to say, you know, maybe we don't need him to be blessed. Uh, yeah, he, he invested a lot into us, but I think we're at the point where we don't need him no more. This is hurting Paul because all he did was take some time away to focus on other churches. And in his absence, he would later tell the church of Ephesus, in my leaving will grievous wolves come in. And in just a few months of being away, he is actually writing this letter from Ephesus. People have come in and destroyed everything. So he starts writing to them about being on one accord. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10, he said, I want you to speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me, my brethren, that there be some of the house of Chloe that are causing contentions among you. Now I say that every one of you say, I am a Paul, I am Apollos, I am a Cephas, I am a Christ. <laughs> Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of y'all jokers. I'm glad I didn't put my hands on you. I'm glad I didn't take part in a sacred moment like baptism with you. But this is what they're doing. It is so divided. There are so many voices. In his baby. And he is saying. Is Christ divided? Why are we not all speaking. The same thing. It's like when people join uproar. But never come to outreaches. I say why did you join our church? I didn't build this church for preaching. Though I think that in my heart. To love people. God made me a decent preacher. But I didn't enjoy, start this. So when you sign up to be a part of uproar, but you never come to an outreach, I, I honestly love you. But I say, maybe this ain't the church for you because we're not building a club. We're building a movement and we can't build this movement with monuments like some of you. Oh, did I say that? Oh, my goodness. See, we, we go offline for a couple of weeks and I mess up everything. But the reason I can say that is because those of you that have my heart and called to this ministry, it will, it will convict you to say, I need to do more. Paul is saying that we must speak the same thing. The love is the same. The way we hug, the way we communicate, the way we talk, the way we serve with excellence. It has uniformity. And that's what Paul is saying. I don't care who comes in, but there must be un uniformity. He will later tell them, I want to talk to you about deeper things, but you can't handle the deeper things in 1 Corinthians 3 because you're carnal. You still need milk. You're still a baby. Because you say, you say that you know, uh, for you are carnal, whereas there is among you envying and, and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal? Do you walk of men? While one says, I am of Paul, one says, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? And so he is coming in 
sadly defending his stance because they are slinging mud at him. And all he did was give his life to pull them out of prostitution, pulling them out of idolatry, pulling them out of their addictions, helping get there because their families, I know you think your family's jacked up. I think my family's jacked up, but I know you think your family's jacked up, but their families were so jacked up that if you read Corinthians, Paul had to confront one family because the son had actually slept with his stepmother. That's how jacked up this church was. Paul was helping families through that kind of stuff. And, and, and they're slinging mud at him. And I've learned that whenever people are going through a bad season, it will always make them feel better to sling mud at you in the mud because of the mud pit they've created for themselves. And so there's a couple points I want you to get and we're going to move on quickly. You need these points because if you're going to be used by God, if you miss these points, you will crack under the pressure. The first M word is this mindset. As a man thinketh, so is he. The Bible says, let the mind of Christ be you. It is mindset. If you don't have the right mindset, you will not survive. So my question is, what's your mindset? Why are you in this? Are you thinking like Jesus? The mindset of Jesus says that if this is my cause, I have to see it through. The mindset of Jesus says, I have to finish what my father gave me. The mindset of Jesus says, I don't care what you think as long as my father is pleased. It's mindset. What's your mind like? As a man thinks, so is he. Your life will never be greater than your thinking. However you think, that's what you're waking up to. Whatever you think about, that's what you're going home to. What's your mindset? Mindset. Motivation. What motivates you? Do you need the claps of people? Do you need the claps of your family, your friends, your coworkers? What is your motivation? Do you need attaboys? Do you need raises? What is your motivation? For this end, Jesus told Pilate, I was brought into this world. For this cause was I brought into this world. What is your motivation? What motivates you? Because if your motivation isn't right, you will jump from church to church. If your motivation isn't right, you will go from woman or man to man, woman to woman. If your motivation is not right, you will go from job to job, friend to friend, you name it. If your motivation is not right, if your motivation is not pure, Paul said it like this, for me to live is Christ to die is a gain. That is my motivation. If I'm here, people are going to see Jesus in me. What's your, what's your motivation? Where's the maturity? That's the next M. Maturity. Are you maturing? Are you still the baby that needs the milk or are you ready for the filet mignon? What's your maturity? Have you grown? Do you know more about your God these days than you did when you were getting started? What's your maturity? Are you finally serving? Are you getting committed to the work of the Lord? What's your maturity? I said this earlier. Mature people will tithe even when the building's not open. Where is your maturity? To every person that says, I don't, I'm not, I'm not in church. You're not mature. It's maturity. When God looks at you, you show him, I am old enough to get behind the wheel of the car. Maturity. Maturity brings trust. That's what it all comes down to. I tell my goddaughter all the time, I say, I have no problem trying to help you get a car along with your mother. I have no problem with that. The problem is, can I trust you behind the wheel of a car? 
You may have the age, but lack the maturity. I know people that are 50, but aren't mature enough to be married. I know people that are 60, but aren't mature enough to even lead somebody to Jesus. What is your maturity? So we said, what's the mindset? Where's your mindset? What's the motivation? Where's the maturity? And where's the multiplication? The first command God ever gave was not through Moses. The first command way before don't touch that piece of fruit from that tree was be fruitful and multiply. When God's hand is on your life, multiplication should be happening. If you're not multiplying, you know, it was uh, Bebe's kids that said it like this. We don't die, we multiply. If you're not multiplying, if I can reverse that, you're dying. We don't die, we multiply. If I'm not multiplying, I'm dying. If I'm not multiplying, then I'm being divided. And wherever there's division, the number gets less and less. There should be multiplication. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, shall he reap. Reaping is different than seed sowing. Reaping is multiplication. One seed can produce one crop that has five different branches coming out of it. Are you multiplying so let's talk about paul's mindset as he deals with the church of corinth give me a wave if you're still with me up it's all about to come full circle let's talk about his mindset he says so let a man account of us as the ministers of christ stewards of the mysteries of god i'm a steward of the mysteries of god i i steward the deep things of god the mysteries he says the first thing you must understand is that before i am anything i am a steward to be a steward means that you understand that nothing you have belongs to you. I steward it for God. The word steward is actually uh, a word that describes the person that was just a little higher than the servant. The steward was the person that was under whoever the, 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 the boss was, we'll say, the, the owner of the field. The steward was the one that kept the servants going. And Paul is saying that's what a preacher is. A preacher is not the master, but a preacher is called by the master to be a steward over all the servants that join the ministry. If you're not a servant, then God has no reason for a preacher to be a steward over you. He says, I am only a, a steward. So if you're not a steward, right away you forfeit the right to be used by God. He says, moreover, it is required by a steward that a man, in order for me to get this promotion, that's what he's saying, for me to be elevated from servant to steward, here's what it takes. I must be required or I, I must be found. That means like Elijah a few weeks ago, how it says Elijah was walking by the field and it says he found him. He says, in order for God to use me and promote me, how many believe promotions coming into your life? How many believe some opportunities are coming into your life? Paul says, in order for me to get to the next level, when God finds me, he has to find somebody that's Faithful, somebody that is consistent, somebody that is committed, somebody that has thrown their life at the level that God has placed me. He said, the reason I got this position is because when God found your boy, he found somebody that was faithful. Somebody who, who, who did not just have faith, but their faith was full. That means they had faith in action. And when God finds somebody that is faithful, 
full, full of faith and executing it. That is the kind of person that God says, I want to take you to the next level. I want to take you to do things that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, hasn't even entered into the hearts of man. But if I cannot get you to be faithful, I can never promote you to a steward. He says, with me, we're talking about mindset, right? Mindset. Stewardship is a mindset. Faithfulness is a mindset. It's something you have to make up your mind to be. For me, I can't, I can't speak for Jamel or Maris. I can't speak for Ashley or Jalen. But for me, and this is where he gets so cold-blooded. For me, it is a small thing if you judge me. <laughs> Look, look at the mindset of Paul. It's a small thing if you judge me. You call me what you want. It's a small thing to me. It's a small thing if you question my walk. It's a small thing if you question my integrity. It's a, it's a small thing if you question my commitment. It's a small thing if you question my motive. For me, it's a small thing, he says, to be judged of you or man's judgment. Yet, I don't even judge myself. Do you know how long it gets to the place, to, how long it is to get to the place where you're okay with being you, yeah, yeah. with all of your struggles, right. with all of your flaws, right. with all of your gifting, with all of your attributes, to get to the place where you say, I don't judge myself. By the grace of God, he would say later, I am what I am. If you don't like me, say goodbye. If you don't like me, leave. Because I don't even judge myself. Some of you are too hard on yourselves. And if you don't conquer the judgment that's between your ears, your mindset, if you don't conquer the way you judge yourself, then you're going to always crumble at the judgment of others. Once I stop judging myself, I could give a flying flip what you think about me. But if I'm still judging myself, then your words become weights that just add to what I'm already thinking. He says, I don't even judge myself. For I know nothing by myself. Yet I'm not hereby justified, but he that judges me is my spouse, is my kids, is my boss. No. He that judges me is the Lord. And last time I read, the Lord said, you are fearfully and marvelously made. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. Wait a minute. So you mean when I see something on YouTube, judge nothing Remember, he would tell Timothy, out of the mouth of two or three, if it doesn't come from the mouth of two or three, believe nothing about an elder. He says, judge nothing before it's time. Well, I don't know about that. Judge nothing before it's time. I always knew. Judge nothing before it's time. Until the Lord comes. And the Lord will bring to light the things of darkness and made manifest the counsels of the heart. He says, you stop judging and let God be the revealer. You're driving yourself crazy, creating stories that if God wanted it to be real, he would reveal it to you. If it's in your head, you got to say goodbye to it. 
This is what conquering your mindset is all about. This is what creating a good mindset is all about. It's literally saying, Lord, you are in control of my thoughts. Not these people who are throwing mud on me. So he's letting us know this is my mindset. And now take a look at Paul's motivation. He says, you are full. Now you are full. <laughs> it's timing. And he's actually being sarcastic. He's saying, now you are full. You weren't this full when I was with you all the time. But now, 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 because I'm gone now because you have Apollos and now because you have Cephas. Now you're full. Now, now you're rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And once again, he's being sarcastic because he's addressing their mindset and their motivation that is leading them to believe that they are okay without him. But now his heart creeps in. He says, I would to God that you did reign. In other words, I don't want you to not be happy. I just want you to be happy God's way. Because if it's not God's way, Karif, you're going to end up back where I found you. And if it's done God's way, those that suffer together reign together. But those that, get, that, that stay together get blessed together. If God's blessing somebody in your neighborhood, it's only a matter of time before he knocks on your door. He, he says, I would that you did reign because if you really reigned God's ways and were connected, I would reign with you. Because if this was really God, he'd be blessing all of us. For I think that God has sent forth us apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. And the word spectacle is a term used for gladiators being put on a stage in a coliseum. He says, I really believe that God has just called us to be lowly. I really believe that God has put us on a stage for the world to just watch. Because when you say yes to the call, you must be okay with everybody examining your every move. He says, men are watching me. Women are watching me. Angels are watching me. They're all watching. Because angels don't know what it's like to get saved. Angels messed up once and were sent to hell, a third of them. They don't understand salvation. They don't understand how God could love us. They don't understand calling and how God could use somebody filthy like us. So angels, the Bible says, examine us. Because we're peculiar to them. And Paul is saying, I've come to this conclusion that to be used by God means that you're often going to have to feel alone. You're often going to have to feel like everybody's examining your life and you have no freedom. He says, I know. Your mother said it. Your father said it. Your co-worker said it. We are fools for Christ's sake. Everything about my life says you're a fool. When I got saved, everybody told me when I quit my job, you're a fool. When I gave my 30s to, to building my church and, and, and staying consistent with it and, and everything was going, you're a fool. But there's a difference between being a fool in the world and a fool for God. I'm not a fool for nothing. I'm a fool. 
for Christ's sake. You, though, are wise. I'm, I'm a fool. You, though, are wise in Christ. We're weak. You're strong. You're honorable. We are despised. What he's doing here is he's painting the disconnect. He's explaining here the disconnect. And this is not a pump up letter. What he's saying is, is how are you so far away from looking like me? How am I a fool? But everybody says you're so wise. He says, how am I so weak? And everybody admires your strength. He, he says, how am I so despised? And you walk into rooms with my haters and there's so much honor. He says to this present hour, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm naked, I'm buffeted. I have, I have no stability. I have no certain dwelling place. I labor working with my hands, but you know what? Being reviled. I bless people. This, this right here, this right here is Paul allowing us now to see his motivation. Paul is allowing us to, to, to creep into his motivation. I labor, I, I work with my hands, but being reviled, I, I bless, I'm so motivated. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as filth, filth, filth. We are the offscoring, or filth of the world. We are the offscoring, the, the scum scratched off the bottom of the boat of all things to this day. He's allowing us to see what motivates him. I am motivated under pressure. Does pressure, it's been said that pressure either makes diamonds or bust pipes. When the pressure hits you, is God creating a diamond or are you a pipe that's busting? Paul is saying, this is my motivation. I am motivated by trouble. And when you're motivated to be used by God, you have to be okay with getting and being filthy. He's telling them, you are clean. I am filth. He's letting them know that if you're going to get serious about this, everything about your normal has to be shifted. Because truthfully, it's not that you're not like Paul, he's saying. Because he says, is Christ divided? Did, 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 did Paul die for you? No, no, no. What he's saying is, it's not about being like Paul. You're too clean to even be compared to Jesus. It's like, I'll look at people's social medias, and they're so clean, man. They're so clean. They're so clean that if I saw somebody dirty ever get a chance to be on their social media, it would make their whole social media stand out and look dirty. <laughs> because they're so clean. And to be like Jesus means that I'm filthy because I'm grabbing the hands of dirty beggars. I'm sitting at the well with dirty women. I'm going into the house of men that are dirty sinners. 
I see more and more Christians getting so clean that I'm seeing less and less filth. And the mark of being used by God means that my whole life looks kind of filthy. And Paul is challenging the church of Corinth to stop being so clean and stop throwing mud at him and start getting more involved so that when the world throws the mud at him, it's also hitting you too. This is Paul's motivation. And as we get ready to close out, he's going to take them a little bit further and say, I'm not stopping with motivation, but in this season, I'm demanding your maturity. I told you in the beginning that most children see dirt and filth and mud the way they see it because of their fathers. I don't know too many kids that were raised by single moms. Not to knock you single moms, you do an amazing job. But I don't see too many kids that were raised by single moms loving to go out and just roll around in dirt and dig holes. It's not that the mother did something wrong, it's just that that's not what mothers usually highlight. Where fathers look at you kind of with shame if you don't come in dirty. Mothers look at you and say, that's my baby if you come off the football field and your jersey and your uniform don't need to be cleaned. My father would look at me and say, you didn't do nothing. Baseball uniforms, that they didn't have dirt on them from sliding and falling in the field. You didn't do nothing. You, you learn how to see dirt from a father. So after talking to them about being too clean, after talking to them about being filthy, look what Paul comes in and say, I'm not saying these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have Cephas, you have Apollos, You've got 10,000 instructors with YouTube. If Paul's saying they had 10,000 back in his days, you got over a million instructors today. And that's okay. Because what YouTube and social media platforms have done is they've made preaching like a buffet. You can taste everything. And that's okay as long as everything doesn't get in the way. It's like when I would come home and say to my mom or my dad, but, but, but Jason's parents let him do it. And most are nodding their head on stage because the response is always the same. Well, I'm not Jason's parents. Or if you want to live with Jason, let Jason's family take care of you. And Paul is saying, it's all okay. As long as you don't come to your church and say, but that's what Jason's church does. You have 10,000 instructors, but you only have one father. And he's not talking from a natural sense. He's talking from a spiritual sense. That's why when you really get committed to a church, when you go to another church, you never fit in. You always stalk their social media page, all that kind of stuff. You know why? Because yes, you left, but you cannot take their DNA out of you. So Paul says, I found you. I found you. I have begotten you. Now, Paul is relating himself to a woman. I have begotten you. I went through the labor pains with you. I was the one pushing while you were partying. 
I was the one pushing while you were on vacation. I was the one pushing while you were still at the club. I was the one pushing while you were drinking, pushing while you were getting high, pushing while you were running around. Paul says, I have begotten you. You got my DNA. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Not Apollos, not Cephas. I don't know what Paul's hang up. I get with Cephas. He didn't really deal with Peter like that. There's times in Galatians where he called Peter out. Him and Peter didn't really rock like that. Read your Bible. They didn't rock like that. Paul called Peter. Peter and Paul's relationship was so toxic that it actually affected Barnabas and John Mark. Paul didn't rock with Peter like that. Peter was kind of wimpy in the terms of leadership. He would go behind Paul's back and teach things that Paul didn't agree with. He would eat steak and filet mignon and all this kind of stuff when he was around Paul and the Gentiles. But when James and John came in, he'd act like he never did it. P Peter and Paul didn't really kick it. Peter was a little too fake for Paul. And I don't know what his hang up with Apollos was. And most believe Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. But I do know this, whatever it was, Paul said, don't follow them. Listen to their instruction. But follow me. If I'm filthy and you're my child, why are you scared of the dirt? If I'm filthy, Hey, you're my child. Why are you so clean? If I'm filthy and you're my kid, why is your mindset not like mine? If I'm filthy and you're my child, why is your motivation not my motivation? If, 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 if I'm your spiritual father and you're my child, why, why, why is your maturity not where it should be? When it comes to this, if you're my child, he says, as we get to our last point, why is multiplication not taking place? He says to them, I can't get to you right now. I can't get to you. But I'm sending Timothy to you. Uh, who is my beloved son who is faithful? Remember Paul said a steward must be found faithful. I'm sending my son who I found because he was faithful. He will bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. He says I'm sending Timothy to you. My son. Don't get it twisted. He's got my mindset. He's got my motivation. He's got my maturity. He, 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 he's got the stuff. He's coming to you. He's coming to you. He's coming to you to teach you my ways. He's coming to you. To remind you that if you're going to follow me. You cannot follow me. And stay clean. He's, he's coming to you. Because if you're going to do it in this season. You have to be okay. With being filthy. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. To show you. That to walk with Jesus. Means that you have to be okay with being the filth of the world. He's coming to you to make you muddy with peace. Muddy with patience. Muddy with kindness. Muddy with generosity. Muddy with sacrifice. He, he's not coming to wash your clothes. He's coming to make you filthy. And God is saying to somebody watching, 
in this season, it's time to get filthy for God. It's time for people that are connected to you to start looking like they're connected to you. It's time for you to go to your job and start making people around you filthy. It's time to start looking at your children and saying you're not dirty enough. You're not praying enough. You're not fasting enough. You're not loving enough. You're not giving enough. God is saying if we're going to change the world, you have to be okay with being the filth of the world. The offscoring of all things to this day. Yes, they may not like you. Yes, they may not talk about you. But God is saying keep on going because all the mud that is being slung at you is making heaven stand up. Paul is saying, you have been made a spectacle. God has put you on a stage being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering you on. Don't run from the filth. Run at the filth. Let them talk. Let them blog. Let them tweet. Let them text. They're only giving you a bigger resume for the kingdom of God. I want you to put in the chat room, I'm getting filthy. I'm getting filthy for my family. I'm getting filthy for my career. I'm getting filthy for my friends. I'm getting filthy for my calling. Put get filthy and shout it as loud as you can wherever you are. Get filthy. Paul is saying, I'm sending Timothy to you. To remind you that if you're connected to me, filth should be your normal. I'm sending Timothy because he is my son. He talks like me, walks like me, speaks like me. He has my mindset, my motivations, my maturity. I'm sending him because one person doing this right can multiply to every person they're touching. Mm -hmm. But if I'm touching you, you should catch my filth. Mm -hmm. How have you been coming to uproar this long and your shirt's still white? How have you been coming to uproar so long and you've never been in an outreach? Come in the uproar so long and you've never contributed to anything. And you think your tithe makes God happy. God doesn't want your tithe. God wants you. Yeah. I'm sending Timothy because multiplication has to take place. This is a season of getting filthy. As I get ready to bring this home, I want to say this. When the high priest at the tabernacle would go in to serve at the outer court, it was messy, it was stinky, it was dirty. And right before they could go to the next level, there was the laver, the brazen laver. It was the only thing standing between their old level and their new level. Was the brazen laver there for them to drink water? Was the brazen laver there just for them to look at their reflection? The brazen laver was there so that they could wash off from the filth of service and enter into the next dimension. God is saying to somebody, the next dimension is ready. But the problem is, you keep getting held up at the labor because you have no filth to wash off. And until he looks at you and he sees that you have a reason to stop at the labor because you've gotten so filthy having mud slung at you. You've gotten so filthy digging till you've hit rock. 
you, you've gotten so filthy digging like Elijah in the plows with the plows while you were waiting. You've been digging and digging like Isaac in the land that God put you in, in the famine and sowing. You've been digging and digging like the prophet in, in the valley, digging, trying to show God that he has the capacity for the next level. You've been so caught up in the dig that now you have a reason to wash off. God is telling every person that has a reason to wash off, get ready for your whole world to change. Change. Get ready to go from the outer court to the inner court. Get ready to go from a place that has blood and stench to a place that has gold, a place that has food, a place that smells like you're on another level. God is saying to every person that has been paying the price tag of the outer court, your whole world is about to change as you wash off your filth. This is what happened to Jesus. Right before the crucifixion, it says that the woman got down and started washing his feet. Why was she washing the dirt off his feet? Because it was time for him to go to another level. He had the dirt from the last part of his journey. That's why they washed the feet. It was all the dirt you accumulated in the journey. All of the dirt from my journey up until this point has to be washed away so that I can start fresh in my next level. You're too clean for the next level. And God is saying, if we could change that today, your whole world could change.